everyone. Welcome to this week's binary episode of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre, with me is Z. Today's topics include yet another iOS bug, uh, and in, in, in the wild bug that was discovered by uh, Project Zero, uh, a post series on exploiting a type confusion in Edge, uh, that being Chakra, not the new Chromium-based Edge, uh, an HTTP protocol stack bug, and a WatchGuard RCE. But before all of that, we have the Spot the Vaughn challenge, which I'll let Z get into as always. Yeah, this week's Spot the Vaughn, I think, is kind of a cool issue. And I do want to give credit where it's due. I didn't actually come acro- across this one on my own. It was one of Sonar Source's um, advent issues, or at least the core issue was. So just give credit over to them for actually calling this out. They did it in a TypeScript. I converted it over, basically. Um, but the gist of the issue, uh, for anybody who's watching here, like, the code itself should just be, basically creates a couple constants at the top, um, one if it is a regex object that just looks for any non-alpha character, so, um, a few questions about the caret character, um, or a few questions that have come up, the caret character is being used when it's inside these square brackets, that means, um, this, it, means in the square bracket it it will match anything that is not the following so it'll match anything that is not a to z or capitalized a to z um it's basically changing the class of what gets matched there um and for the people kind of thing that's only matching the first character what test does so in line two it creates this function here has non-alpha which just takes that regex and applies test to whatever string you provide it um what test does is it looks for, does this regex match any part of the string? So it will run that across the entire string. You don't need to write a regex to match the whole string, which is another thing I saw coming up quite a bit. The issue here is something that I think is pretty non-intuitive, but it is the slash G character at the end of the regex. So the regex just creates a class there for not... A through Z, um, slash G, so saying global. And that's kind of the issue, because this now exists in, uh, because these are also global variables, that regex will actually store state across runs of test. Um, so every time you run test, it's going to take note of what index it last had a match at, and then the next time you call test, it's only going to search after that index again. So you end up where if you call it twice on the same string, so you could basically uh, move the index forward a little bit, run it on the same string, and it's going to start searching again. So if you only have like one bad character, it's not going to find it the second time. And you kind of move the index along until it's not found. Um, And if you end up trying this code like I did initially, just playing around with it in uh, the Chrome developer console, when you type in function names, it likes to go ahead and call them and kind of show you a preview of what the output's going to be. But because it's running it, it's changing the state of that non-alpha regex. And so that kind of messes with trying to figure out how the heck this thing works. Um, so it's just a really fun bug. I think it's really easy to overlook that just global variable with slash G. I can't imagine. Um, and I believe this also happens with slash Y, which is sticky. Um, I can't imagine why you would actually want this unless the script were some sort of one-off. You only run it, like, once. But in any sort of long-lived application, basically, I don't think you'd ever want to be using slash G um, on a global regex. Like, if if this were all declared, these two values were declared inside the function, no issue because it's created new every time. So there's no state, but in this particular case you can kind of introduce that really non-intuitive bug. I think it's a really cool thing, and it's really easy to overlook. Um, yeah, this and, is something that I don't think I would be able to spot if I was just reading the code. I would have to play around with it. Oh yeah, I definitely wouldn't have. Um, And I mean, I tend to add on a lot of regex slash G just kind of by habit, by wanting it to match more than once. The fact that it kind of has this weird operation, uh, you know, it's quite possibly could have been me just because of how it works there. And yeah, I, I hadn't known about this one until I saw the uh, sonar source bought the vault. So, yeah, you know, I'll give credit to them for actually coming up with this one, but I think it's an interesting issue. And I mean, now that I'm aware of it, it's something I'd definitely be looking for when it comes to JavaScript. All right, so we'll get into our topics. 
Uh, our first post here is an RCE in WatchGuard, which is like a network monitoring tool. Um, this is an analysis that they did using a public, though only briefly public, uh, POC uh, as a base for trying to look into the issue and trying to root cause it. Um, so I'll pull that up on the screen here for those that are watching. The immediate things they noticed right away was the fact that uh, it was building this malicious or a malformed uh, XML payload, which would start a tag followed by a payload of A's, um, this other like BBMA tag, um, and some byte escape sequence strings, which look like they might be ROP gadget addresses. So they kind of had the suspicion that there was some kind of overflow or corruption happening because of the malformed XML. And then they were just ROPing at the end of that. And because this is kind of like the IoT space, um, the fact that there's direct gadget addresses in there suggests that there's probably not like ASLR or something. Um, so they got WatchGuard set up and they got a debugging environment going through the POC into it. Um, and when they got into the XML parser and looked at the handlers, they found one of the handlers, uh, which was start element NS, would end up using Surcat to build up this uh, the XPath query for traversing the document. And there was no limit to how many times Surcat was called, and there was no bounce checking on it because it's Surcat. So, yeah, there was the potential to trigger a heap overflow there, uh, which is what this POC ended up doing. I believe the overflow was in a global buffer here in the BSS segment. So after overflowing enough data, I think they said like 11,000 bytes, um, they were able to hit heap memory because, like I said, there's no ASLR, so the mapping is kind of consistent there. Um, so... Yeah, exploitation turned out to be pretty easy. Um, they were able to just corrupt some of the callback pointers in the XML parser themselves um, so that the next time a start element NS callback is invoked, they just hijacked the code execution. There was also no data execution prevention in play here, so they could just write a short rock chain to stack pivot and then just jump to shell code they had on the stack. So, um, yeah, fairly easy exploit. Um I think it's been a little bit since we've seen a, a bug that has spawned from like, you know, the stir cat, stir copy, those class of like dangerous functions. But um, yeah, yeah, whenever I you mean, see them and you see user input making its way to them, it's quite concerning. There have definitely been more bugs reported uh, that we just haven't covered because in a lot of cases, it's not all that interesting. So yeah, they just copied too much data or, you know, fixed size buffer. Like, for a while there, it's almost like a meme, just, yep, uh, copying data into a fixed size buffer without checking the size. That's the issue. And I mean, that happens plenty. Oh, that said, I mean, I kind of like this one just because it's such a huge overflow for their exploit. Like 11,000 bytes uh, to jump from BSS right down into the heap and keep going a bit, actually, in order to get to the point where it's just like, I don't know, it's just such a crazy long thing. Like, it, it's not all that. Oh, um, I guess crazy, but I don't know. When when you see it being that long, it is kind of fun to at least point it out. When it comes to the actual setup there, um, like I said, like it, there isn't a lot here that's complicated. It is a pretty straightforward exploit and everything. I did kind of appreciate them talking a little bit about doing their crash analysis. Unfortunately, um, or actually, I think I am... Let me see here. Uh, so we have, I might be thinking of another post, but yeah, sorry, I am thinking of our next post uh, with comp that I was going to make, so I'll reserve that. But I do appreciate seeing a little bit of the crash analysis as to how they kind of figured it out. Just a different approach from what we usually see when it comes to talking about these vulnerabilities. Um, Bleak and chat mentions, you know, it's still a pretty popular issue in my experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've covered so many like that. It reaches a point where it's just, uh, while it's popular of an issue, it's not that there isn't much we can say about it. I mean, you overflow the buffer in a very traditional way. You know, it's an issue that has been around for literally decades. Yeah, like you said, it's cool to see kind of going in the reverse direction of finding a POC or an exploit and, and trying to root cause it and you know, backpedal a little bit. Um, and yeah, like you said, we have another topic that goes into that. So I guess we'll, we'll jump over to that uh, and I'll let you take it. Yeah, this is our uh, a second somewhat straightforward issue. Um, not a big fan of core security's posts here. Although part of that just comes down to the fact that they're once again, kind of um, working backwards. They have a crash 
or at least one point they're able to get the crash and they they're just trying to create the exploit not so much explain what the actual issue was so they walk through their process of like doing a little bit of diffing to try and find what this vulnerability was um so this was one of like windows patch tuesday in the http stack um they basically were just trying to write an exploit for one of the cvs that got patched did a little bit of patch diffing to try and find it. Um, had a little bit of, I guess, bad luck with people reporting, here's one vulnerability, and it turns out it actually wasn't. Um, like, people wrote up exploits for the CV that weren't for the CV. Uh, but they did Yeah, it was end up for, happening. like, a similar issue that was, like, in the same area, but it was an earlier uh, patched yeah. bug, I think. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, all these... Proof of concepts for one bug just weren't even for it. Uh, but they did end up coming across, uh, somebody also posted, uh, in terms of detecting the XY from Corelight, uh, that indicated that for this, it used a malformed HTTP request that had a missing HTTP uh, slash 1.1. So in the request line, you'll have like your get path and then HTTP version. Had a missing there. And the other thing they knew was that this had to do with uh, HTTP trailers. Um, although they don't touch on that a lot. So I've been going through a bunch here. Just talking roughly about. Uh, I guess the meta of the vulnerability. But getting to the actual point. Effectively it was just an uninitialized value was being used. Um, ultimately it would end up getting used. And um depending on the values of that uninitialized thing, it'll end up calling um, mm unmap lock pages. So uh, effectively unmapping some of the pages, depending on the flags of that value. So effectively all their exploit does is just kind of sends this malformed request that has two main conditions, no HTTP slash 1.1 in the request line, and the TE header coming in, which is your... You can kind of think of it like an accept transfer encoding. It's telling the server what the client will accept for the transfer encoding of the response with that set to trailers. Um, which I think might actually be relevant to the vulnerability, but they don't go into that. Um, anyway, in, with those two conditions, you end up having an uninitialized value getting used. Depending on the flags, you control a pointer that gets unmapped, uh, which can easily cause a crash. So all they did was basically spam a few requests to fill up the heap um, with, you know, some that's going to trigger that, trigger this uninitialized use, and lo and behold, they get a crash. That's all they went for with the X-Flag, no full strategy on that. I thought it was interesting, though, the fact that this malformed request took the no HTTP, like the HTTP version, and the TE header specifically on trailers. The reason I find that interesting is because the TE trailers as a header value pair is the only acceptable value for the TE header if you're using HTTP 2. Um, on HTTP 1.1, there's, you know, a few different options you can use there. But for 2, only trailers is acceptable. So my guess is that there's something going on where when it doesn't see a version, it doesn't match a version... Um, something isn't getting initialized there, that it then, when it sees the TE trailers, is maybe thinking it's two, and so starts using it and thinks the version's already been determined. I don't know, they don't go into the actual vulnerability, but I thought that was a really interesting case to introduce that. Um, and some that might be worth digging into a little bit more. Especially when it doesn't just fail with that malformed, like, missing HTTP, uh, version information. Uh, unfortunately, they go a lot into this crash analysis and, like, getting a proof of concept going, not so much into the vulnerability because all they cared about was getting a crash or, well, sorry, getting a proof of concept. Yeah, oh. so I did want to point out a little bit, like, after they got the uh, the uninitialized use going and what was going on there, um, it, it's the MDL, or memory descriptor list, that doesn't get initialized, which might sound familiar to those um to do like windows exploitation um the reason i wanted to point that out is because it is a pretty important data structure that can be used multiple ways and i'm not totally sure how like unmapped locked pages itself could be used 
to do something useful. Though they they do point out like this vulnerability as exploitable, though it would be an unreliable and unstable exploit. Um, my guess is maybe the unmap isn't where you would be able to get primitives, but later on in the call stack, um, there's something useful you could do with something else from the MDL that doesn't get initialized. That's just pure speculation, though. Like where this is um, dealing with the Windows API, it's it's a little bit tougher to say for me because I don't do Windows stuff. But uh, yeah, I wish they delved a little bit more into that and how um, this vulnerability could have actually been exploited, even to just get some some useful primitives, even if they didn't take it all the way to code execution or whatever. But um, yeah, like yeah. they don't even really speculate on possible uh, attack avenues as far as I know. It's literally just going for the crash. Um, Because yeah. my initial thought, well, I guess um, they do say RC's possible, hard, and unstable, but they don't really yeah, go that- into it, Um, I guess. But they do say it's possible there. I mean, my thought is, like, if you have an unmap, that seems to me like being able to create and use after free situation. I don't know the internals of Windows well enough to say that is definitely the case. But that at least is where I'd go. And although I guess if you had that, um, granted, you'd still need an info leak on. Well, I guess uh, you'd really need to try and force it to get remapped somewhere being a full page um, rather than just like a reallocation of something. Some challenges there, but I mean, my intuition would say going kind of a use after free sort of situation. Um, But like, I mean, I don't have uh, enough experience there to say definitively if that's a possible route. To be fair, they do say in the conclusion that in addition to that, it is necessary to mix this phone with an info leak. So yeah, the, you couldn't full chain this bug on its own. So, which is pretty significant when you're talking about RCE. So, so it's good to call that out. But yeah, I mean, like Z just said, uh, core security states this vulnerability is exploitable, though probably unreliable. Um, but yeah, they don't really go too much into the nuances of that. They just mostly focus on the crash analysis. Um, kind of an interesting bug. Don't see uninitialized use too often compared to some of the other classes that we cover. So. Yeah, it was a bit of a nice uh, nice change in that regard. Yeah, and like I said, the way it's introduced is interesting to me. The At least that connection between the version, HTTP version, and the T headers being necessary. Like, I kind of wish they'd have delved a little bit more into why, but that wasn't their focus, so totally fair not to. Um, cause it is an interesting setup, just... Because they don't really explain, like, why trailers even seem to be necessary, and the only connection I really see between the two is, as I said earlier, HTTP2 specifically only accepts that one value. Yeah. Alright, so uh, we'll get into our next topic here, which is from Project Zero, and is an iOS in the wild vulnerability. Uh, And uh, I'll let Z take this one away, too, because he got a bit of a better read into it than I did. Yeah, uh, another nice, long, lots of background in here um, regarding some of the iOS um, internals. Ultimately, the bug itself is pretty simple. The challenge of understanding it is understanding why it really matters. Um, And I guess Seguza here actually kind of tweeted, basically iOS 14.4 added locks around a little bit of code because this e made seems to function as a ref count, and you should race it and eventually gain a double free, which is effectively all the issue is. Um, it is the fact that this e made was prior to 14.4 incremented without any sort of locking. But why does that matter? Um, because e made is not itself a reference count. Um, and this post goes into a ton of the internals that, one, I don't understand, two, probably isn't going to be useful unless you're actually doing the iOS or maybe macOS internal or, like, exploitation yourself, in which case it seems like there's a lot of good information here. But the gist of it comes down to um, you have various structures, um, and the names here get a little bit... Uh, Complicated, like you've got your IVAC, and you've got your IVACE, and IVAM, I think, is another one. Very similar names to kind of work with here, too, making it quite fun to get your head around everything. 
Um, kind of what you have is this user that, uh, um, User data value element? Yes, that's value thinking, element. Yeah. That's what it was. Uh, you've got the user data value element. Those are generally uh, going to be owned by an entry structure that has it so... Generally speaking, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, some entry owning the actual user data value element. And so they don't reference count the user data value element, but they do reference count the IVAC or... IVAC entry and all of that. Um, and so where this emade comes in is the user data value element has this emade field and all it does is get incremented. Every time a pointer to this structure is handed out, it just increments this value. Never decrements it, only increments it, so it is not a reference count. Um, and they use that, they compare within the entry. Um, it also contains its own made field that is going to basically track how many times it's been made um and so when these two values should generally speaking always be equal um you're always going to have the user data and you're always going to have the entry and these two values will be equal except during one really small race window where during an initial allocation it will um allocate or it needs to call k k alloc and during that window it can't hold the lock um while it's doing the allocation. So it has to drop the lock on the object, do the allocation, repick up the lock. Um, and so it kind of creates a scenario where things can kind of change unexpectedly during this very brief window on it. So it does some checking afterwards and it keeps track of this made count. And um, so during this brief window, the user data value element gets incremented. Then, you know, it's going to go back and get assigned into the entry and then it gets incremented on the entry also. So there's this brief window where there are different values. And while they're different, if the refer if the last reference on the entry were to get dropped and it starts freeing all of its children, um, it'll know, hey, this we're just about to assign this pointer. Um, so don't free the user data value element just yet. Um, so it's used to kind of tell it. It's inside this one very rare race window. If I didn't explain that very well, I apologize. It's kind of hard to follow because the complexity here just comes from understanding all of the structures involved. Uh, but the gist is when you have this issue that uh, you can increment the emade value in just this unlocked state, you can race that multiple times, hopefully getting uh, an increment to or basically two calls to it to happen but it only increments it once because they both read the same initial value, add one to it, leading to an increment of one rather than an increment of two, despite two of them, two pointers having been made, ultimately leading to inside of this other rare race window, it being willing to free it because it thinks it's okay, um, leading to your um, use after free situation. Yeah, it, it, it did get a little bit complex even after the vulnerability to understand why it was impactful too, because this emade field is not a real reference count that has like, um, you know, like a lot of times in kernel with reference tracking, you'll have like a decrement and the decrement will check if it sets it to zero and then it'll free it. Um, but because this isn't a real reference count, it's kind of like a pseudo reference count. Um, you have to take into account the, the how the code is operating more because it's doing the management itself. It's not passing off the management to the reference count directly. So yeah, there's a lot of complexities involved with this post. Um, it does essentially boil down to like a desync caused by the, the race condition, um, but there's a lot of nuance involved um, that the, the Project Zero post goes into. Uh, yeah, I did like, want to... Oh, I was just going to toss on there. Like it's a complex issue to kind of wrap your head around everything, but I think the core of it, or at least the takeaway, really just comes down to that unlocked um, increment when it's some that should be locked. Of course, you need to know that it needs to be locked, and it's only actually incremented in two different places. One has a lock, one doesn't, so you could think that maybe there's some reason for that. Um, they do get a little bit in their conclusions into... Uh, kind of discovering this sort of issue um, and kind of pointing out so, one is... Oh, go ahead. 
Yeah, before you get into that, I did want to touch a little bit on like the the uh, original context you were pointing out of like how they had to drop the lock um, while doing the allocation, that kind of anti-pattern. That may sound weird to people who like haven't really looked at kernel too much, so I did want to talk about it a little bit. Basically, why that happens and why that's such a common pattern in kernel code is there are certain functions like kmalloc that they can't sleep. Um, if they sleep, it's going to deadlock, the system's going to freeze up, and that's obviously not something you want uh, in the operating system. So, um, and the way locks work is, you know, if it locks, it allows the thread to sleep, something else can get scheduled in, whatever. Um, so because of that, yeah, it's just, they have to, that's a necessary evil with um, how parallel programming works in the kernel. Um, so that's kind of why that anti-pattern exists, even though you might think, like, why would they do that? That's so dumb. Like, yeah, it's just necessary. Yeah, it's uh, go ahead, necessary. Darcy. It is always a... It is something to always pay attention to when you have those brief lock windows where something's unlocked and relocked. Um, like, they are always suspicious, but it is a pattern that does exist for a reason. So you can't just say, like, they do that, that's bad, and it's going to be a vulnerability. Uh, but it is a code smell nonetheless. And yeah, I was just going to jump into kind of the end here. Their conclusion is a little bit about trying to discover this, and basically they just have a few ideas. One is, you know, just read the code, of course. That said, it takes a lot of context to really spot this issue and a lot of knowledge there. They do also toss a little bit here about a couple of tools, I think. We've maybe talked on podcasts even before about some similar stuff, uh, but static lock analysis tooling and dynamic lock analysis tooling. Uh, but I think this is like this is a common enough issue where you just have something that should be locked that isn't at some point. That it feels like you know there should be some decent static analysis tooling for it, like it's common enough, and it feels like a simple enough issue for it. Um, and yet. You know, there really isn't anything that comes to mind. Um, but it is one of those things that, like, I'd like to see more research into this, or even do it myself, actually, uh, given the number of times I've seen this sort of issue. Um, I don't know, I mean, are you familiar with anything, Spectre, that kind of exists in that area? Uh, sorry, in the static uh, block analysis tooling you're talking static about? Static or dynamic, yeah, just any sort of, like... I mean, dynamic feels like, um, I don't know, so they actually call it uh, TSAN or Thread Sanitizer here as being, like, maybe able, not able to do it right now, but something similar to it, uh, that sort of instrumentation. But, like, I don't know of anything that does this sort of locking instrumentation yet. Yeah, there's been some, like, research into it, more on the dynamic side, I think, uh, like we've seen with, like, KT SAN and KC SAN with Linux kernel and whatnot, um, which I guess kind of makes sense because d like dynamic and fuzzing is kind of where academia has been focused for a while. They're not really that interested in the static side, or at least not as much. Um, so yeah, other than I some of the like research the... into the dynamic angle, not really because it's especially in the kernel, it's a really tough problem to solve. I mean, maybe not so much on the static side, but on dynamic, like. Um, instrument in the kernel in general is just notoriously difficult because you have a lot of performance considerations. You just have the considerations of the kernel in the way that you can't just, um, you can't take as many liberties as you can with, with user land. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that hasn't gotten a lot of research, but it's also because it's just a really hard problem. Um, static lock analysis, I think would be more promising in my opinion. But for whatever reason, there just doesn't really seem to be a lot of focus on the static side of things, um, I mean, at least from like the research community. On the static side of things, though, you kind of have the... Actually, I guess with both, with pretty much any approach, you also have the issue of you need to define what the locking interface is. You know, kernel might not lock in the same way something else does. I mean, something like Python, it's maybe easier because, you know, you have the threading.lock or threading.mutex or whatever it is. That generally speaking, is going to get used. So that'll cover a lot of cases just to have the right interface on, or, like, mapped onto it. But then also mapping down what are the structures, so... I don't know, it feels like, I guess, a dynamic approach feels a little bit more promising. If you were to, say, introduce a... 
uh, like developer annotations maybe indicating that, like actually just commenting basically what lock should be held for a certain structure. Um, and then you'd be able to kind of assign the mappings. Oh no, I guess that is going to be a challenge with any sort of dynamic analysis is how is it going to know what needs to be locked or unlocked? You can kind of take that probabilistic approach and say like, um, hey, this thing in like, you know, 80% of all access is locked. And then there's these 20% that are really like, un that are not locked by whatever and kind of making the conclusion that way. But that, that still feels, you know, then where do you draw the boundary on what to report or not? Um, so obviously there are sometimes going to be cases where certain access can be done without a lock. Um, Perhaps because, you know, something else is locked. Like, there is definitely a lot of complexity here. Oh. I, I wanted to tunnel in on something else you said, too, which is, um, you know, the idea that the locking in the kernel isn't so simple. Because another problem is there's so many different types of locks in the kernel that are used. So there's the more common spin locks that you that you'll see that are relatively simple to understand and see the windows for. But then you also have RCU locking. And you might have some structure that's not explicitly protected by a lock, but it's protected by RCU. Um, and they kind of do that on purpose because they have some performance implications there or whatever. And they have like um, comments that say like, we're aware of this and we do it this way for this reason. Like there's, there's multiple levels of locking you can have, like you can literally have uh, locking on structures inside of structures. And then when you throw on RCU and these other different types of locks on top of it, that really complicates the static side of things. Um, and then on the dynamic side of things, like they call out there, there's a lot of false positives. If you look at like the syscaller, or sorry, sysbot um, page, you'll notice there's an entire invalid section, which has thousands of reports that are basically filled with KC SAN reports. Because like, there's a lot of times where concurrent access on a field is just not useful, or it doesn't matter in a security context. And it's pretty much it's really difficult to determine if it's a security bug or not or if it's even a bug at all without doing a lot of manual time investment into looking at it and then at that point when you're getting like hundreds of these reports and you have to keep looking at them manually is it really is it really worth doing that i mean kind of the whole point of the dynamic and like uh the dynamic tooling and the fuzzing is kind of taking some of the manual load off so and then the case of dynamic like thread sanitization uh it's adding more work on so yeah, yeah there's, well, there's mean, tough problems on both sides the performance side like you just need enough that you can kind of run it it doesn't need to hit the same performance that the real kernel runs because we're not going to have like every user running a sanitizer with their you know production oh, kernel but for I the fuzzers i mean you still have the fuzzing considerations sorry go ahead yeah, sorry, I wasn't trying to imply that there was a like a performance consideration with the fuzzing. Um, I was saying more the manual overhead on triaging is vastly in increased. Yeah, um, and I will kind of comment a little bit with KC Sand. KC Sand is a kernel concurrency sanitizer. It's not. It is looking for something a little bit different than this sort of lock analysis. Because it's looking for data races, specifically. So that will also then report on things like you could have two different operations happening just in a different order. And it'll report on that, uh, which isn't necessarily a security issue whatsoever, but it is a, a potential or a conceptual bug. Uh, like, KC Sen just has a lot of noise um, when you're looking at that, because there's a lot of... There are a lot of data races that are just not security related whatsoever. Um, Bleak actually calls out, and there are many cases where you don't need a lock at all, or you do for in one function but not in another. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess there's there's a lot of complexity to it. Uh, at the same time, like it does feel like there are at least some easy cases that might be detectable here. Um. But yeah, the, trying to have anything universal would definitely not be an easy approach. I don't know. I mean, just talking about it now, I think I'm also kind of coming to a... It feels like a simple issue, but as we keep discussing it there, I mean, there's a lot of depth to this. Yeah. 
And that's a good call out too, is like you have some data structures that are implemented in a way that's safe and also lockless because they take advantage of memory semantics and whatnot. So you'll have like lockless ring buffers and things like that, which, uh, you know, static analysis tooling might falsely flag as a race condition or, or some kind of security issue. So yeah, there's a lot of different considerations. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like the conclusion section too. It's always nice when project zero goes into speculating on how this bug could have been found. Um, generally with these types of race conditions, the sentiment that I've gotten, um, just from like personal experience and from looking at other posts, more likely to be manual review, just because it's typically harder for fuzzers to hit these types of bugs and detect them. Um, because like we were just talking about the, the Santa's is eight or sorry, the, uh, the instrumentation is just not really that good for it. Um, you know, there is thread sanitizer, but it's pretty, pretty early. Uh, it's, it's not really in a stable state at the moment where you can use it and still have like high performance fuzzing. So yeah. yeah the- um, I There's think a it's lot of... more probable on manual review, but that's my opinion. They don't really say that in the post. Yeah, I completely agree. I think uh, what they brought him up here was more on how how it could have been found um, and how to improve the research techniques rather than, you know, speculating that somebody actually discovered it with, like, the different tooling here. I agree with you, most likely reading the code. Largely because any sort of dynamic analysis needs a way to spot it and... You know, there's nothing right now that, like, causes a crash on this sort of case. And, like, the case itself, being that it's a race condition in another race window, um, that you have to have cause this one in that race window. Like, it is just such a small window for any sort of detection thing to have figured out. Versus just being that intimately familiar with the code. All right, so we'll get into our last post here, which is um, the second post out of three posts by Connor McGar throughout March, um, with the last post just published last week. And the entire series uh, is on exploiting a JIT type confusion in the Chakra engine, um, which is the old, like, Microsoft's proprietary engine for Edge before they switched over to to Chromium based. Um, Now, these posts are really long and they go into a lot of detail. So I'm only really going to be covering the bug and some of the exploitation stuff here. But just be aware, like there is a lot more here than what I cover. And there's a lot of useful diagrams and stuff there too that are good visual aids. Um, So the bug is an old one, as you can imagine, since like I said, Edge doesn't even use Chakra anymore. Um, And it's pretty interesting. It's basically a logic bug where you can get a function jitted um, by getting it recognized as a hot path. Actually, let me just bring it up here for, for those who are watching. Um, there's a pro- They link to the Project Zero issue in the first post. So yeah, um, it's basically this logic issue where you can get a function jitted by getting it recognized as a hot path, or in other words, calling it a bunch of times. Um, and that jitted function can do something like use an input object as a prototype, um, which may sound harmless enough, but the problem is, in order for an object to become a prototype like that, it has to undergo it uh, through a type transition. And things like inline properties end up getting stubbed out and converted into auxiliary data slots. Um, Now, under normal circumstances, the JavaScript engine will be aware um, of what's going on there. And there's guardrails set up to prevent, uh, you know, being able to access the object as a different type. Um, The problem is when it gets jitted, the init proto opcode doesn't consider that side effect. Um, so no special consideration is taken. So you end up getting a type confusion where you can basically gain arbitrary control over the auxiliary slots pointer through what's used, what used to be memory for the inline properties. Um, in the POC, this causes a crash because they write uh, hex one, two, three, four into this field. And when that, especially when that gets encoded into like a NAND box value, that's obviously not going to be a valid mapped pointer. So it'll go to dereference that and it'll crash. Um, but you can do something more interesting than that because of how dynamic objects work in, in the JS engine. Um, you can basically get the engine to write pointers in that field for you by setting the property to an instance of some other object. Uh, and then that pointer will be followed whenever you try to access properties on that type confused object. Um, so that kind of gets into the, uh, the second part, uh, of the, the blog post series, um, where he talks about taking advantage of different objects and kind of expanding your primitives. Um, 
there's also some other fields that are like relevant here that you would be able to overwrite with your properties being like the the vf table and the type and stuff like that um you might think it would be obvious to smash the vf table with just some pointer that you control you know get immediate code execution problem is like I said, there's NAND boxing going on here because JS engines will basically encode the type into the value. So I think it's the upper 16 bits, uh, I want to say, will it's basically be used as a tag. Here. Oh, 17. Okay, yeah. So basically the upper 17 bits of like the 64-bit value will encode whether it's a J like an integer or you know some other, like a pointer or whatever. Um, so because of that, that kind of messes your ability to place uh, an arbitrary pointer there. Um, and similarly, if you try to read it, you know, the JS engine will see that it's, it's an integer and it will just read it as such. Um, what you can do though, is abuse that trick to set up an object. Um, so you, instead of writing an integer into the pointer slot, you write an object to cause basically another type confusion. Um, and the object they use here is a data view object, which a data view is basically a, a way of accessing a raw memory buffer through JavaScript. You know, it's going to be bounds checked and everything. It, it's like a managed buffer, but um, it, it lets you access memory without having to deal with this NAND boxing, uh, which is pretty important. Um, so basically, they they use their type confusion to point to get an object to point to a uh, data view object, which again extends their corruption into being able to corrupt the metadata of that data view object, um, which they then again point to another data view object, um, which basically makes it so the first data view can get a read write window into the metadata of the second data view. Um, so kind of just chaining corruption primitives to get more useful uh, memory control. So. Yeah, now that you have this ability to corrupt the data view and you, because you're using a data view to corrupt it, um, there's no NAND boxing going on. So you can read the VF table or virtual function table of that second data view to get an info leak. Um, and then similarly, you can smash the buffer, uh, the backing buffer pointer to get like an arbitrary read write primitive. From there, it's pretty standard with browser. Um, to get code execution, well, okay, I say it's fairly standard, but code execution wasn't immediately like easy to get because even though they could leak like a virtual function table, um, your first thought might be, you know, just hijack the virtual function table, smash it, and point to your own things. Um, the problem is Edge has Control Flow Guard or CFG in play, so the forward edge is protected. They couldn't just smash a function pointer and, and be on their way. Um, it won't jump to non-valid function targets. So what they ended up doing here was attacking the stack instead, because while the forward edge was protected, the backward edge wasn't. There was no like shadow stack or something. Um, so they could leak a stack pointer, uh, in this case through the type field, which has a reference to the JavaScript library, which then points to the script context, um, which had some stack pointers which they could then use the arbitrary read write to scan the stack for some return addresses, smash one and get code exec that way, um, which they used to run a rock chain, which would pop calc with win exec. Now, all of this was in the context of Chakra in isolation, as it's not running in the context of Edge at this point. The third post talks about porting this exploit into Edge, which had some additional challenges because Edge has some additional mitigations. Uh, for example, it, it wouldn't allow spawning child processes using something like WinExec. And there's also code integrity guard that's running, so you can't load like non-Microsoft signed DLLs or something like that. Um, and there's also arbitrary code guard. So with ACG, you can't map your own read, write, execute pages or try to update existing page permissions to make like a code page writable or something like that, uh, or make uh, a data page executable. Um, I don't want to go too much into that because we've already talked like quite a bit about the exploit and the bug, um, but basically they chain with an existing 2017 end day, uh, which abused the bug in how the JIT server managed handles. Um, basically, it allowed an attacker to duplicate a handle within the JIT process as a real handle, which they could use to write shellcode into the JIT process, uh, essentially bypassing ACG because JIT obviously can't have ACG. It has to be able to read or map uh, executable memory. So yeah, just kind of taking advantage of the JIT server there. Um, like I said, these posts are, are pretty long. The scroll bar gets a little scary if you look at it, though a lot of that is 
like code snippets and diagrams and stuff. Um, but it does do a, a really good job is. of explaining the primitives and how corruption in the browser works for those who aren't familiar. It's very accessible um, to to people who outside of browser exploitation. Yeah, a lot of it is like the screenshots, the code. I mean, a lot of it though is just valuable uh, information. Um, so I think actually when we were talking about this before the show, you know, I went and removed all the images and all the code, and it was still, you know, a pretty lengthy read. Um, I kind of wish there was, like, a table of contents on these or something to kind of skip around, or at least know what's coming. Kind of get a feel for what's going to happen there. That said, like, a ton of useful information in this. Um, One thing Connor McGard does do with these posts is he's just starting to get into, well, I guess it's been a little while now, but understand getting into the browser exploitation and so he's writing these up with like everything that he's learning as he goes um trying to make it a valuable resource for somebody that isn't already into browser exploitation but wanting to get there um and yeah so it's, it's a solid set of posts um definitely a lengthy read there's a good deal of kind of the background the theory the reasoning going on within this too rather than just the core issue, which, I mean, makes it a pretty good resource, I think. Yeah, and I want to point out, like, even though this is talking about exploiting a bug in Chakra, which is dead, um, basically, browser exploitation, a lot of the, like, knowledge and internals is pretty transferable. Most browsers work the same way when it comes to, like, ex when it comes to what's relevant for exploitation. Um, like, you know, chaining these objects together and, and exploiting them. Um, like in Chakra, they're using a data view here, but in WebKit, you might use like a UN32 array. But it's kind of the same idea. It's just a little bit different, uh, like a different name of the object or whatever. So a lot of this is transferable. Um, so don't just think like this isn't useful because it's talking about a dead engine. Uh, a lot of this will be transferable to Chrome and WebKit too. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah. especially if you're just getting started, I mean, I can't really comment on how transferable it is because I don't do the browser exploitation at all. Um, but I mean, in general, like, you have similar applications, so the internals may vary, but you're applying very similar concepts. I did want to jump back on something. I meant to bring this up earlier. Uh, when you're talking about the CFG bypass, which was effectively just skip the forward edge and go for the backward edge... That's trying to remind me, this feels a little bit like the um, early days with uh, NX or DAP and ASLR, where it's like, just having ASLR on, um, or just having DAP wasn't necessarily um, the most damaging thing. It was when you had ASLR and DAP enabled that suddenly you need to go, uh, you need like the info leak, you need the ROP, and you need to kind of go for a more complex chain. It feels like with CFG, kind of the same deals going on right now. Uh, just having that forward edge protection without also having shadow stack or something protecting the backward edge. You're kind of just left with this really easy backdoor, but it's when you have both of them that things kind of get a little bit different, I guess. Yeah, when you have both of them, you're going to see more of a shift towards like data oriented attacks. Um... But yeah, at least for now, it, it does seem interesting that CFG seems to have taken off and has become a lot more prevalent than protection of the stack because like attacking the stack has been around forever. Like that, that was kind of, you know, the very early days of, of exploitation. So it feels weird that that is the side that's lagging behind. But yeah, I mean, there, there is stuff coming. Some of the new AMD CPUs have, uh, have shadow stack like hardware support for the for it Does so AMD we will it? see it um I intel has so. cet i didn't know that amd released a equivalent on that but i know cet does um shadow stack it might be coming with zen 4 i i can't remember if it's coming with zen 4 if it came with their last batch of cpus last year um but i they do have the technology um it's yeah, just okay. not like mainstream across their their desktop line yet so yeah we will see it eventually uh, it will take a bit of time to get there, but like you said, when both of them come, that's when you know the meta will shift a little bit. I think. Yeah, and, uh, um, it's Sienna, uh mentioned in chat there. Nobody has stack buffer overflows in these targets anymore, except for when it happens. Um, and that is probably part of it in terms of why more folks on the forward edge 
Because, I mean, a lot of the attacks are on, like, you know, the B table override, where you're overriding the function pointer into whatever chain or something. Um, or just function targeting function pointers in general. Um, has kind of been more of the meta going on. So, by doing this, you're kind of removing most of the gadgets by forcing it to only jump into um, the actual functions, rather than partway through. Yeah, I guess, like, in this kind of situation, you're basically breaking the boundary of taking, like, an arbitrary read-write to attack the stack, um, but your initial corruption point isn't in the stack, so, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense as to why there would be more focus on trying to prevent the immediate, uh, or the more immediate, like, primitives that you would typically get since, like, exploitation is more heat-based now, so, yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, and I guess um, uh, one other point related to that is it does feel like I don't know what the actual like history is on exactly when things came about, but I feel like we've had Shadow Stack for a long time. Um, like the whole idea of a Shadow Stack has been. Re I mean, granted, not in hardware. Having it hardware protected is a big difference, but I mean, even with the CFG, this is still a software CFG, I believe. Uh, well, I mean, Chrome, I believe does partially or at least okay windows definitely supports the like cet stuff though there is some hardware support coming out there um but a lot of them just use the clang cfg which is a software-based implementation uh so i mean i have kind of wondered why we haven't seen more shadow stack i think part of it has just been performance on that side um but it has been a thought i've meant to kind of look into it i guess a little bit um, and just haven't, but, like, Shadow Stack has been known about for a while. Maybe it's just the reward-benefit, or cost-benefit analysis, not reward-benefit, uh, uh, that kind of leads towards not using it, but, I mean, it's been around for a good while, so I have been a little bit surprised that I haven't seen it more often. The performance angle is a little interesting, because I suppose, like, you're gonna be returning from functions, and you know, transferring control flow that way a lot more than you're going to be following function pointers or virtual calls or something. So, yeah, it very well could be that, but I'm not totally sure why we haven't seen more of it yet. But like I said, I'm sure we will. It's it's coming, but it's not here yet. Yeah, I mean, with hardware support, it's uh, obviously the performance becomes a lot, a lot less because the hardware is actually supporting it. Um, I mean, we'll definitely start seeing it more for sure. At least I assume. I mean, I've been wrong about my predictions in the past, so, you know, we'll see what happens, but I imagine. Yeah, and it's worth calling out, like, memory tagging and stuff kind of acts as a protection there, too, um, which there's also hardware support coming for. I mean, it's already landed in ARM. Um, I don't think too many things support it yet. The Linux kernel recently got support for it, but it'll be a while probably before we see that in, in any amount of devices, but um, memory tagging is kind of another angle to, to tackling these kinds of attacks, so um, but yeah, that that's probably even further down the line. But yeah, like I said, um, jumping back a little bit to the Connor McGar posts, I think these are a good read if you're interested in browser exploitation, though it might take you a little bit to get through them. Um, I, I think it is worth it, but like you said, I, I wish there was a bit of a table of contents so you could jump around and you know, if you see a section that you're like, okay, I know how this works, so I can skip it. Um, you can't easily do that. You kind of have to read through it and be like, okay, I understand this part. Just keep scrolling. Um, Jumping yeah. around, or even uh, just like from a beginner who maybe wants to jump into it to know what's coming, to realize that a lot of this is like, this is background on here or here. Like, I don't know, it just makes it feel a little bit more digestible to see the contents laid out. But maybe that's just me. I just like seeing table of contents and... I just have a thing for that, maybe. Um, uh, but it feels like that would just make it a little bit more digestible. But beyond that point, like, I mean, that is a super minor thing to fault the post on. It's like, you know, literally, um, uh, this part three here is 350 minutes, so hundreds of minutes, so hours of reading. And it's like, yeah, I wish there was table of contents. Super minor issue. Rest of it, solid. Yeah, I, I will say don't put too much stock in the estimated reading time because that does like estimate the complexity using like the code snippets. So that's going to be pretty yeah. inflated. But yeah, it's, it's still a pretty bit of a long read. 
But yeah, uh, other than that, I don't think we have any other topics, so I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up the show. So, uh, yeah, thank you everyone who tuned in. The VOD will be up on YouTube and Spotify and other platforms tomorrow. Uh, feel free to follow our Twitter and join our Discord to join the community. Um, and also notifications are sent out there too. We are talking a little bit in chat about how, how much Twitch notifications kind of suck. So, <laughs> yeah, um, follow our Twitter and our Discord and you might be able to get the notifications a bit more reliably. Um, but yeah, uh, with that said... We'll see you next week when we're back on Monday and Tuesday for the Bounty and Binary episodes, respectively. And we'll see you then.